Um, welcome everyone to this afternoon session. Um, so let's start the fourth lecture of this course about uh, composition algebra. So please, Professor Alberto. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so see, these days we were dealing with Kurbis algebras and these are the unital composition algebras. And we proved that essentially they all can be described using the Kyle Dixon doubling process, which is the same process that was used by Hamilton to get quaternions from complex numbers, and later Graves and Kyle to get octonions from uh, quaternions. Uh, and then uh, we moved yesterday to study uh, the case that happens in case, for instance, the field is algebraically closed. So the situation in which our norm, which is a non-singular quadratic form, is isotropic. And by isotropic means that there is a non-zero vector whose norm is zero. This is always the case for any quadratic form over an algebraically closed field if the dimension is at least two. So we were studying this particular situation. And what we got is that there are some orthogonal idempotents we can always find in uh, isotropic Kurbis algebra, starting with an element of zero norm, a non-zero element of zero norm, and playing a little bit with the norm and the properties that we already know, it is easy to find a couple of orthogonal eigenpotents, E1 and E2, such that the unity is the sum of these two eigenpotents, and the product of these eigenpotents is trivial. Uh, well, we denoted by K the subalgebra spanned by this idempotence. And then we look at the orthogonal subspace. And we check that the orthogonal subspace of K splits as the direct sum of two subspaces, U and V, which are called the pairs components uh, relative to this idempotence. The uh, U subspace consists of those elements in our isotropic Kurbis algebra, uh, such that uh, these elements are fixed by the left multiplication by the first idempotent and by the right multiplication by the second. However, when we left multiply by the second idempotent or right multiply by the first idempotent, we get C. And V, well, for V, we have to reverse the order of the idempotents. And it turns out that the whole Kurbis algebra splits as the direct sum of the subspaces spanned by the idempotents and then these two extra components, U and V. If our isotropic Kurbis algebra has dimension eight, then we know that these subspaces have dimension three because we check that these subspaces are paired by the norm, which is non-degenerate, and therefore, I'm going to assume for a while that these subspaces have dimension three. And now we have to check what the multiplication looks like when we take elements in these pairs components, okay? So we start playing with the things we know. So if we take two elements in the first pairs component, the component U, and we take the product u1, u2, and we uh, apply the polar form to this element and elements in k, well, remember, we can move things to the other side, taking bar. But u2, the elements in u are orthogonal to the unit because they are orthogonal to all the elements in k. So in particular, they are orthogonal to the unit. So for these elements, x bar is minus x. So u2 bar is minus u2. So we can move u2 to the right with a minus, but minus k is k. So we have this situation. And now the idempotence multiplied by u2 give either zero or u2. Anyway, they give something in u. And we know that u is an isotropic space. The norm of any element in u is zero. So we get that the product of two elements in U is orthogonal to the subspace spanned by the idempotence. 
Now, if we compute uh, the norm of u1, u2, comma v, where v is an element in the other phase component, then, well, v is in uh, the second phase component, so v equals e2 times v. And now remember that the second linearization of the multiplicative property of the norm allowed us to play a little bit and swap elements from one place to the other and so on. So applying this second linearization, we get that this is zero. Okay. So what we get is that whenever we multiply two elements in U, the result is orthogonal to both K, to both the impotence and to V. And because of the non-degeneracy of the norm, of the polar form of the norm, uh, these forces that U squared is contained in V because the orthogonal complement to K and V, the sum of K and V is V. So immediately it follows that U squared is contained in V. In the same way, one proves that V squared is contained in U. Okay, so we start looking at properties of the product of the products of elements in U and V. So whenever we take two elements in U, the product lies in the other component. Whenever we take two elements in the second component, the product lies in the first component. So we start getting properties of that. Now, doing the same kind of computations, whenever we compute, uh, when we evaluate the polar form of the norm in elements in U and in products of elements in U and V, we move U to the other side, as we have been doing all the time. U squared, now we know it is containing V. V is isotropic, so this is zero. And in the same way, we get this other equality. So this means that the product of elements in U times elements in V is orthogonal to both V and U. And the orthogonal complement to U plus V is K because U plus V is the orthogonal complement to K and we have non-degeneracy. So just playing a little bit with the polar form, we see that whenever we multiply an element in U and an element in V, we get something in K and the same in the reverse order. Actually, one can be more specific. And if one is more specific, one computes the polar four applied to UV and E2, moves things around, uses the properties, and so on. And immediately, one gets that this product, which lies in K, so it is a linear combination of E1 and E2, the coefficients that appear are as follows. Whenever we multiply u times v, the product is a scalar multiple of E1, and the coefficient that appears is precisely the ones that appear on the slide. So whenever we multiply elements in u times elements in v, we get a scalar multiple of the first idempotent. And if we multiply in the reverse order, we get the same scalar multiple, but of the second idempotent. Okay, <clears throat> now we continue playing with the polar form of the norm and the properties that we know. And just playing with this, we can get that U squared is different from zero. The same happens with V, V squared is different from zero. And finally, we should consider this trilinear map, trilinear map uh, from U cross U cross U into the field we take three elements in U. And what we do is we take the product of the first two elements. This is an element in V because we have checked that U squared is containing V. And then we take the norm of this product X, Y, and Z. See, this is trilinear. So it is linear on each component, but it's more than that. It is alternating. Alternating means that whenever two of these elements are equal, the result is zero. So if X and Y are equal, the result is zero. And the same if Y and Z are equal. Why is this so? Well, whenever we take an element in U, it is orthogonal to the unity because all the, and the unity lies in K. So, uh, and also, 
we know that the phase component U is isotropic. The norm of any element in U is zero. So the Cayley Hamilton equation, remember each element satisfies a degree two equation, this Cayley Hamilton equation, but all the coefficients that appear in this Cayley Hamilton equation are zero because X is orthogonal to one and because the norm of X is zero. So Cayley Hamilton equation in this situation tell us exactly this, that X squared is zero. So using the result that we already know, uh, we get that any, the square of any element in capital U is zero. And therefore, whenever Y equal X, what we get is N of X squared comma Z, and this is zero. And also whenever Y equals Z, what we get is the norm of XY comma Y. Now I can move Y to the other side with Y bar, but Y bar is minus Y. So moving this Y to the other side, I have to put Y bar here, which is minus Y. And now I have Y squared, which is zero again. So whenever two of these elements are equal, we get zero. And this, is, this means that the, this trilinear map is uh, alternating. Okay. And being alternating means that whenever you change the order of two elements, you have to change the sign. Okay. And moreover, this trilinear map is non-zero because of the properties we have proved so far. So we have a non-zero trilinear map on a three-dimensional vector space. And the space of trilinear maps on a three-dimensional vector space has dimension one. So this is up to scale as the unique possibility. But okay, so we have a non-zero trilinear map. And now we can take a suitable basis of U. So what we are going to do is take a basis of U that gives one with the trilinear map. This is always possible because this trilinear map is different from zero and we can scale to get one. So we can always take three elements that gives one and these three elements, because the four is alternating, these three elements are linearly independent and therefore form a basis. So now we have a basis of U, a nice basis of U. And whenever we multiply two elements of U, we get elements in V. So we take this, three elements in V. V1 is the product of U2, U3. V2 is U3, U1, so we permute cyclically U1, U2, U3. And now using the usual properties, it turns out that this is the dual basis because of this. See, U1, U2 is V3. So the norm of V3 comma U3 is one. And so just using all these things that we know immediately follows that this is the dual basis in V to the basis that we have taken in U relative to the norm. Now, everything is completely determined. For instance, if I multiply U1 times V1, well, we know that whenever I multiply U1 times V1, I get this scalar, which is minus one here because these are dual bases, E1. So I know the product of E1, V1. E1, V2, the product is zero because these are dual bases. So the norm of U1, V2 is zero. So with some patience, one gets all the possibilities. For instance, if I want to compute V1, V2, well, V2 is U3, U1. Now I can use one of the properties that we used before in the proof of the generalized um, um, Hurby theorem uh, to exchange these two elements. Now V1, U1, well, we know what it is, is minus E2, minus minus disappear. And U3 times E2 is U3 because U3 lies in this space component and this space component consists of the elements that are in 
are left invariant when we multiply on the left by E1 or multiply on the right by E2. So just with a little patience and some computations, it turns out that we get a basis of the isotropic Hurwitz algebra of dimension eight, and the multiplication is completely determined. It is completely determined. And here is the multiplication. So with some patience, you can fill all the slots in this multiplication. We have filled some of them. So remember, U1, V1 is minus E1. However, V1 times U1 is minus E2. Whenever we multiply an element in V times an element in U, we get a scalar multiple of E2. In the reverse order, we get a scalar multiple of E1. And so, whenever we multiply E1 by an element in U, well, these elements are left invariant by left multiplication by E1. So E1 times E2 is E2 and so on. So everything is completely determined. So see, what we have proved is that if we have an isotropic Hurwitz algebra of dimension eight, we can always find a couple of orthogonal idempotents, E1 and E2. We take the base components, we can choose a suitable basis in each of these base components and the multiplication is completely determined. And you always get this multiplication table, exactly this multiplication table that uh, you get here, okay? And uh, so this means that up to isomorphism, there is a unique isotropic Hurwitz algebra in dimension, four, in dimension eight. And the multiplication table is exactly this one. Okay. What happens if the dimension is four? Well, if the dimension is four, everything that we have done is valid. The only thing is that the space U has dimension one, the base component U has dimension one. So there is a unique element, U1. You take the dual basis in V, which also has dimension one, and all the computations we have done are valid. So if the isotropic Hurwitz algebra has dimension four, then we can find a couple of orthogonal idempotents plus an element U1 plus an element V1 with the multiplication table here. You forget about U2, v, uh, U3, V2, V3, and you get a multiplication table, which is a four by four, okay? And this is the only possibility for dimension four. So what happened? is that we get a unique up to isomorphism algebra. In dimension A, this is called the split Kylie algebra. And this is the notation that we will use. And in dimension four, also we get up to isomorphism, a unique possibility. So up to isomorphism, there is a unique isotropic Hurwitz algebra of dimension four. But we already know that two by two matrices with the determinant form an isotropic Hurwitz algebra in dimension four. So it has to be up to isomorphism this algebra, okay? And actually it's quite easy in this algebra to find elements E1, E2, U1, V1 with the same multiplication table. Mm -hmm. For E1, you take the matrix, the diagonal matrix with one and zero, the diagonal. For E2, you get the diagonal matrix with zero and one. For U1, you get zero, one, zero, zero, and the same with V1 at the other side. And you get this multiplication table. Okay. So, and in dimension two, this is trivial. So what we have proof is that up to isomorphism, uh, there are only three Hurwitz algebras with isotropic norm. In dimension two, what we get is the direct sum of uh, subspaces spanned by idempotents, so up to isomorphism. This is the Cartesian product of two copies of the field. In dimension four, the algebra that we get is the algebra of two by two matrices. The norm is the determinant. Determinant is quadratic and the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. So this is a Hurwitz algebra. And in dimension eight, there is a unique possibility 
which is the split Cayley algebra. And this is the algebra with the multiplication table in the previous slide, okay? So in particular, over an algebraic closed field, the only Hurwitz algebras are in dimension one, the field. In dimension two, F cross F. In dimension four, matrices over F. And in dimension eight, the split Cayley algebra. And there are only four possibilities. What happens over the real numbers? Well, over the real numbers, quadratic forms are determined by the rank and the signature. Since these are non-singular quadratic forms, the rank is the maximal rank, the maximal possible rank. So quadratic forms are determined by the signature. But not all signatures are available for Hurwitz algebras. The result is that the real Hurwitz algebras are up to isomorphism. The algebras I talk about the first day, so the classical real division algebras, of real numbers, complex numbers, Hamilton quaternions and octonions of Graves and Cayley, plus the isotropic ones. So in dimension two, R cross R, in dimension four, two by two matrices over R, and in dimension eight, the split Cayley algebra over uh, the real numbers. And why is this so? Well, this is easy. See, <clears throat> if you take any non-degenerate quadratic for over the real numbers, it, it is either isotropic or definite. Or it is either positive definite, negative definite, or uh, if the signature is not zero or the maximal or the dimension, then there are isotropic vectors, non-zero isotropic vectors. So the norm of any real Hurwitz algebra is either definite or isotropic. If it is isotropic, we know that these are the only possibilities, up to isomorphism. Okay, so that's it. If it is definite, well, it could be positive definite or negative definite. But in a composition, in a Hurwitz algebra, the norm of the unity is always one, it's positive. So if the norm of a Hurwitz algebra is definite, it is positive definite, okay? So there is only one possibility. The, either the norm is isotropic, and then there are only three possibilities up to isomorphism, or the norm is positive definite, and then we know that all the algebras are obtained using the kiley dixon Dublin process, starting with the real field. But the norm being positive definite implies that the scalar that we take at each step can be taken always to be minus one. So in the first step, we get the complex numbers. In the second step, we get Hamilton quaternions. And in the next step, we get octons. There is no other possibility. Because in case the norm is positive definite, then uh, all the algebras are obtained using the Cayley Dixon Dublin process, starting with the field. And in, at each step, the scalar that we use is minus the norm of an element. So it is negative, and we can scale to get minus one. And if we use the scalar minus one with the real number, we get the complex numbers. Now, if we use the scalar minus one, we get Hamilton quaternions. This is exactly what Hamilton did. And if we use the scalar minus one with Hamilton quaternions, we get the octonions. And this is exactly what Graves and Cayley independently did. And there are no other possibility. So not any quadratic form may appear, not any non-singular quadratic form may appear as the norm of a Hurwitz algebra. Actually, the quadratic forms that appear are the so-called Pfister forms in dimension up to eight. But well, this is another subject. But, uh, see, in the case of real numbers, only if the norm is isotropic, what we get is a form of signature four in dimension eight, or two in dimension four, or one in dimension one. Otherwise, it is positive definite. So only precise signatures are possible. 
So this is about real Hurwitz algebras. Uh, so now we know this isotropic Hurwitz algebras, and now I want to move to another family of composition algebras, which are non-unital. They don't have a unity element. Okay, and these are called the symmetric composition algebras. Okay, and now I'm going to be more careful with the notation because from time to time uh, we are going to apply tricks which are similar to Kaplansky trick that we used yesterday. Remember, Kaplansky trick was useful to check that any finite dimensional composition algebra, even if it is not unital, uh, has dimension which is restricted to one, two, four, or eight. That's it. And Kaplansky trick consisted on passing from a non-unital composition algebra to a unital composition algebra, to a Hurwitz algebra, where we know that the dimension is one, two, four, or eight. And the way to pass was to define another product on the same vector space. So for symmetric composition algebras, the product will be denoted in general by this star, okay? Not by juxtaposition. Because some of these algebras will be obtained by using some kind of Kaplansky trick uh, to uh, uh, Hurwitz algebra. So the product in the Hurwitz algebra will be denoted by juxtaposition, and the product in the new algebra will be denoted either by a star or by a bullet. Or we'll see. So, <clears throat> so now I'm being more precise a composition algebra. So we have a vector space, a multiplication, and a non-singular norm, and is said to be a symmetric composition algebra if the multiplication and the norm relate in this way. See, uh, this is what Justin uh, McEnroy called Frobenius algebra in the commutative case. What uh, Hill Salgado called Frobenius algebra was a bit different but it was related to that. So uh, it is the same kind of uh, connection. So see, for Hurwitz algebras, we can move things to the other slot of the polar form using the involution. Now things are in a sense easier. I can move Y to the other side, just putting at the other side. So if Y appears on the right, in the first slot, I move it to the other side on the left. Yes, I change the comma of place, okay? So again, in these algebras, I can move elements to the other side of the polar form, but in a simpler way for symmetric composition algebras. So this is the definition of a symmetric composition algebra. And uh, the first result tell us that uh, if we start with a composition algebra, and in general non-unital, we do not assume the existence of a unity, well, this composition algebra is symmetric if and only if it satisfies these two equations. So whenever we multiply x times y times x in any order of parentheses, what we get is the norm of x times y. Okay. So if I take the element y and I left multiply by x and then right multiply by x in any order, what I get is the element y scaled by the norm of x. So see, if you take any element of non-zero norm, it means that whenever you compose the left multiplication by x and the right multiplication by x in any order, you get a uh, non-zero scalar, the norm times the identity. So left and right multiplication. This, this equation, these equations imply in particular that left and right multiplications by elements with non-zero norm are bijective. And essentially one is the inverse of the other up to an scalar, okay? And the dimension of any symmetric composition algebra, again, is finite, exactly as for Hurwitz algebras, and restricted to one, two, four, and eight. This is something that we know. 
¿Cómo tú pruebas? Bueno, if we start with a symmetric composition algebra, so this means that we can move things to the other side of the polar four, just moving the cone. Okay. So if I compute the norm of x times y times x comma z, I can move the x to the right, like this. Now, using the first linearization of the multiplicative property of any composition algebra, whenever x appears on both sides on the left, I can take the norm of x outside, and this is what we get. This is because of the first linearization we use, the second day. Now, this is a scalar, and this is bilinear. So I can move the scalar here as follows. And if the nor if the polar four is non-degenerate, since this is valid for any cell, if the norm is non-degenerate, if the polar four of the norm is non-degenerate, we get immediately that these two things are equal. If the polar four is degenerate, remember that this can happen in characteristic two, well, then one has to check that the norm of this element is zero and one gets all the computation and one gets zero. But don't worry about this technicality. In general, in dimension at least two, the polar four is non-degenerate. So from this equation on top, we immediately get that this element equals this one. And this gives this part. The other part is proved exactly in the same way. Okay. And in the reverse direction, one has to be a bit more careful. I want to check that if these equations, uh, left and right multiplication, multiplication by x gives a scalar multiple of the identity, uh, if these equations are valid, then I can move things from one place to the other of the polar four. So I start with the polar four applied to x times y comma z. Well, uh, assuming that the norm of y is different from zero, right multiplication by y is bijective. So the element z can be written as z prime times y for certain z prime. Now, using the first linearization of the multiplicative property allows us to forget about the y's and move the y, the norm of y outside. Now again, by linear, so I can put the norm of y here and use the property that we know. And this is said, so we get what we want. So with some patience, we have checked that if this uh, property, if these two properties hold, if these two properties hold, then we can prove that the norm of x times y comma z equals the norm of x comma y times z, at least if the norm of y is different from zero. But see, any if now we want to prove the same with an element of norm zero, well, any element of norm zero is a sum of two elements of norm different from zero. This is an easy exercise with, with non-zero quadratic forms. So that's it. It is enough to prove things with non-zero with non norm elements. One can use Tarisky topology and all kinds of things, but well, it is, uh, we don't need uh, this kind of uh, more technical uh, results. Okay, uh, so uh, the uh, so we have proof what we want to prove, and finally about the dimension. Well, we can use Kaplansky strict because left and right multiplications are bijective here, so we can use the exact Kaplansky strict to prove that uh, 
it is finite dimensional. And well, if it is finite dimensional, uh, we know that the dimension is one, two, four, or eight. Okay, so that's it. Now, examples. So we have defined this class of, in general, non unital composition algebras. These are composition algebras where I can move things around very easily in the polar form. Or equivalently, we have these two equations that give us a weak form of uh, associativity. Actually, this is the flexible identity plus something related to, to the norm. So examples. And it turns out that there are not many examples. And the first example is very silly, if you allow me to use this expression. Take a Hurbizal, so one of our unital composition algebras, and define a new product with the ballet, okay? With the new product, the new product of X and Y is defined as X bar times Y bar. Okay. And this is very silly. We, we have a, an algebra with a multiplication. Now we define a new multiplication. This is what, what we did uh, with Kaplansky's trick. Okay. Well, uh, now using this new multiplication, you compute n of x bullet y comma z. x bullet y is x bar y bar. Now, this is the product in a Hurwitz algebra. In, and in a Hurwitz algebra, I can move this y bar to the other side, applying the involution. So I can move y bar here as y bar bar, but y bar bar is y, okay? Now the involution is an isometry. So I can apply the isometry on both sides. On the left, I get X. On the right, I get ZY bar. But this is an involution. So this is, this equals Y bar Z bar. And Y bar Z bar is Y bullet Z. Okay. So just be careful with these computations and you easily realize that with this bullet product, the algebra is a symmetric composition algebra because it satisfies this equality. And this is the definition of a symmetric composition algebra. So starting with any unital Hurwitz algebra, we can define a symmetric composition algebra just by changing the product and considering this valid product, okay? And this is called the para Hurwitz algebra associated to the Hurwitz algebra. Okay. And see, now the unity of the Hurwitz algebra is not a unity of the para Hurwitz algebra because with the valid product, one multiplied by X is X bar. One multiplied by X is one bar, which is one times X bar. And X bar in general is different from X. So the unity is no longer a unity for the bullet product. Okay. The, it is called a para unit. This is a different story. This is another story. Okay, now other examples. And this is where the fun starts uh, because well, para Hurwitz algebras are just Hurwitz algebras with a different product. Not big deal, it's essentially changing a little bit. So the, these are the same algebras that we had before and we changed the product. Are there new symmetric composition algebras, really different new symmetric composition algebras? Well, let's start with the case where the characteristics different from three. And assume at first that our field contains a primitive cubic root of unity. Okay, it is the characteristic different from three, so this makes sense. Okay. Now, take a central simple associative algebra of degree three and take the elements of zero traits. Uh, if these fancy words confuse you, okay, take the algebra of three by three matrices over the field F and take the subspace of zero trace matrices. Okay, if this is too fancy, forget about it. Take three by three matrices 
over the field F and take the matrices whose trace is zero. So take all this, the eight dimensional space, see three by three matrices for a vector space of dimension nine. If you impose that the trace is zero, what you get is that the space has dimension eight. The characteristics are different from three. So you have a splitting of the identity matrix, the subspace spanned by the identity matrix and the zero trace matrix, the space of zero trace matrix. Well, we are going to define a new product in this space. So we are going to take zero trace three by three matrices and we are going to get another three by three zero trace matrix. If you multiply two zero trace matrices, in general, the trace is different from zero. So we are going to do some funny thing. Well, first I want you to check uh, one thing. You take any three by three zero trace matrix and you compute the trace of the square. So you compute this, you compute the trace of the square. Okay, so you take a matrix X with entries A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever, with zero trace. So the sum of the elements of the diagonal is zero and compute the trace of the square. So you compute the square, take the trace and you will see that since the trace is zero, since the sum of the elements of the diagonal, what you get is twice some quadratic expression. But you get a two. All the components appear with a two. So it makes sense to simplify by two and take the quadratic expression that is left. Well, this makes sense if the characteristic is not two, but even if the characteristic is two, you can take the expression that appears multiplied by two and only that expression. So, so you simplify by two. So what I mean is that you get something that makes sense even in characteristic two. Okay. It can be defined in other ways, but, but the natural way, the naive way is uh, this way. Okay. So even if the characteristic is two, it makes sense to compute one half of the trace of X squared. And this gives you a quadratic form. And actually it is a non-degenerate quadratic form in dimension eight. Okay. So now, now define a multiplication in S in this way. The product of X and Y, see, X and Y are zero trace three by three matrices or elements in a similar algebra. Well, the definition is as follows. <clears throat> we multiply X and Y. And, and we scale this using omega, the primitive cubic root of one. Okay, in general, the trace of this element is different from zero. Now we multiply X and Y, but in the reverse of Y, X, and multiply by omega squared and subtract. And the problem is that the trace of this element in general is not zero. And I want to multiply two elements in S and get an element in S. Okay, so I have here a matrix and I want to get a zero trace matrix. Well, it is enough, enough to subtract a suitable scalar multiple of the identity matrix. And this is the multiple you have to subtract. See, the trace of the unity matrix is three. The trace of XY equals the trace of YX. Okay, so when you compute the trace of this, you get zero. Okay, this is a nice linear algebra exercise. Okay, so in this way, given two zero trace matrices, I get a new zero trace matrix. And now I have a quadratic form, which makes sense even in characteristic two. And it took some time to realize that characteristic two was not specific. Okay. It can be defined this form in a, in a different way, but this is the natural. Okay. And it turns out that starting with three by three matrices, which is something very associative, three by three matrices, 
modifying the product in this way, uh, we start computing and I'm not going to check all this, but this is an exercise that you can do using that omega is a cubic root of one. So omega plus omega squared equals minus one. And if you take the square of omega minus omega squared, you get minus three. So whenever you get too many omegas, you can use that omega is a primitive cubic root of one. And you get all this. And since we are dealing with elements of trace zero, one can use the characteristic polynomial, simplify things using linear algebra, yes, linear algebra. And one gets that x times y times x equals x times y times x. And this equals the quadratic four times y. The quadratic four applied to x times y. So starting with a with three by three matrices, zero trace matrices, one can define on the eight dimensional space of zero trace three by three matrices, one can define a product that is defined in terms of the usual product of matrices, but we multiply x, y, we multiply y, x, we adjust with the scalars and we adjust to get zero trace. This is the final adjustment. Okay, so let me repeat the process. We multiply x, y, we multiply y, x in the reverse order. We adjust with the scalars, the primitive cubic root of one. And finally, we adjust to force the element to have trace zero. And the last adjustment is just adding a scalar multiple of the unit. You don't have to remember this thing because it follows. What you add is the necessary scalar multiple of the identity matrix so that what you get has zero trace. Okay? And it is very funny that starting with a very associative object, three by three matrices, modifying in a funny way the product, restricting this product just to the space of zero trace matrices, and considering also a funny quadratic four, what we get is a symmetric composition algebra. And these are called Okubo algebras. Well, this is over fields of characteristic three, assuming that the field contains primitive cubic roots of the unit. What if this is not the case? Well, again, characteristic different from three. If there are no primitive, if the only cubic root of one in the field F is one, then we can always take a quadratic field extension, adding a root of the irreducible polynomial x squared plus x plus one. So this is a quadratic field extension. <clears throat> so for instance, take the real field, the field of real numbers. Well, the only cubic root of unity in the real of, in the field of real numbers is one. But if we add to the real numbers a cubic root of unity, we get the complex numbers. Adding to the real numbers a root of the polynomial x squared plus x plus one is the same as constructing the complex numbers. So for the real numbers, we, what we get here is the complex numbers. And now we can take, for instance, three by three matrices over this larger field. And we need an involution, an involution of the second field. If you are not familiar with that, don't worry. Think about three by three complex matrices. This is an associative algebra of dimension nine over the complex numbers. And consider the usual involution on these matrices, which consists of transposing and taking conjugate in all the entries. Okay, the usual Hermitian involution or unitary involution. Better. Okay. Well, this is an example of an involution of the second kind. Second kind means that uh, when you restrict to scalars, you take the involution in the field. And the complex numbers, you have an involution. Here you have 
a unique involution because the Galois group, this is a Galois field extension and the Galois group is cyclic. So you have a unique orthomorphism of order two. Okay, so there are many things involved in this, but simple. We're just dealing with three by three matrices and extensions, field extension of degree two. And then instead of considering zero trace matrices, one has to consider zero trace matrices, which are skewed with respect to the involution. When you apply the involution, you get minus X. Think about three by three complex matrices, the usual unitary involution, and you get zero trace matrices that are skewed with respect to the involution. <clears throat> and this is an eight dimensional space over the field F. It is not an space over K. Is a vector space over F. And now in this space, we can use exactly the same format. Because see, the Galois holomorphism here takes omega to omega square. So using that, the same formulas x star y equals omega xy minus omega square y x, blah, blah, blah. The same norm, and everything works. And you get an example. And in this case, these are the Okubo algebras over this. If, if you are familiar with uh, central simple associative algebras of degree three, which are either matrix algebras or division algebras, uh, then all this can be done in general over these central simple associative algebras of degree three. And these are Okubo algebras. Okay, I'm running out of time. So let me just finish with some remarks. In principle, Okubo, I, I talked to you about Okubo the first day. Remember the last slide? By the way, I will put my slides on my web page so you will be able to uh, uh, consult, consult them later on. Uh, <clears throat> the first day, in the last slide, I mentioned Okubo, Susumu Okubo who was a mathematical physicist who passed away a few years ago in 2015. But he had a wonderful mathematical mind. He was always thinking of ways of doing things and uh, he was able to get involved formulas and he had an incredibly uh, capacity of making computations by hand, uh, involving products, involutions, whatever. And uh, so initially, Okubo uh, working, uh, see the, the special unitary group of uh, degree three is quite important for physicists because it is the group involved in the um, color symmetry of quarks and anti-quarks. I don't know much about that, but uh, I know this uh, group is the important group, uh, the, the group of symmetries that appear there. <clears throat> the corresponding Lie algebra is the special unitary Lie algebra, which are the three by three matrices over the complex numbers, which are skewed with respect to the unitary involution, and of zero trace. So this is exactly what we have considered uh, in the previous slide. And he considered this problem here. He realized that in this Lie algebra, because this is a Lie algebra, he could define another product and with this other product, he got a composition algebra, which was non-unitary. And, uh, and he turned this algebra, the algebra of pseudo-octonics, because for him, he had obtained something similar to octonics. Composition algebra, also in dimension eight, well, it was non-unital, therefore it was not alternative, but he checked that it was at least flexible. He checked that it was Lie admissible, that was easy from what he also, so he got nice properties, and this is the first algebra of this type that appeared. Uh, this was called by Okubo the pseudoctonics. This was obtained already in 1978. And then in joint work with uh, Marcel Osborne, he studied these algebras, uh, especially over fields of characteristic different from three. Uh, over fields of characteristic three, they put some restriction, and I will show you how to forget about this restriction, okay? And actually the name of Okubo algebras was a birthday present for Okubo. When Okubo turned 60 years old, there was a big conference and there were four or five Nobel laureates that attended this conference. 
And uh, Hugh Mun and myself presented a paper, a paper in this conference. And the title of the paper was Okubo Algebras. It was the first time that Okubo Algebras appears, the, the name Okubo Algebras. And in this paper, we proved some properties of these algebras and decided to call these algebras Okubo Algebras and not pseudotonians, that was the name used by Yokub in general. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, even though Okubo had discovered these things in 1978, with Thinking in a completely different way, Faulkner in 1988 rediscovered Okubo's construction, but he from he started directly from central simple alternative algebras instead of associative algebras. And he was interested in these algebras being alternative. Central simple or separable, uh, separable alternative algebras of degree three. But the idea was exactly the same. Faulkner later on discovered that this was already uh, done by Okubo and that the formulas were essentially the same. But uh, the idea of Faulkner of using not just central simple associative algebras, but uh, separable alternative algebras of degree three uh, was the clue to get a complete classification of Okubo algebras and of symmetric composition algebras. And that was obtained in 1993 with the characteristic different from two and three. Later on, we noticed that characteristic two was valid too. Uh, and uh, characteristic three is a bit different. And tomorrow I will start with characteristics. And finally, the name symmetric composition algebras was given in the book of involution. This is a incredible book by Nuss, Mercuriev, uh, Rose, and Tignol uh, that deals with algebraic groups, quadratic forms, non-associative algebras, and many other things. So I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. So let's thank the speaker. Uh, are there any questions or comments? I hope the students will do the exercises that have been appearing uh, in the different slides right. and the computations with traces, matrices, and so on. I would like to ask one question, please. Yes, sure. Uh, it's about, it's a little bit of side question, but about uh, para Hurwitz algebras. Uh -huh. Yes. How old are these? Well, they, they were discovered more or less at the same time by Okubo, actually. Uh, so, see, uh, Okubo uh, realized, and I guess it was a surprise uh, for him uh, to check that inside some associative setting, like three by three matrices, complex matrices, he could find something similar to octonomous. And then well, he checked that this was a composition algebra. He checked that this was non-unital composition algebra, mm -hmm. but uh, that this algebra had some nice properties, these properties that are in the definition of symmetric composition yes. algebra. And then he started thinking, well, are there other algebras other than this Okubo algebras, this pseudotonium mm -hmm. for him? And then he discovered the he 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 played with octonions, and discovered that just twisting the product with involution, he got another class of algebras with the same properties. They are composition algebras. They are non-unital, but have this property that you can move things to the other side of the polar form. So it was Okubo and Okubo and Osborne, uh, I don't remember exactly the first paper where the paraptonians appear. I'm not sure if it is a paper of Okubo or Okubo and Osborne, but it was around this time. So Okubo, once he got some nice algebras, composition algebras, even though he was not a mathematician, uh, he asked himself, are there other algebras with the same properties? And uh, he realized that there were other and he classified with some restrictions these, these algebras. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, 
uh, more questions? Um, so let's thank the speaker again.